<laughs> yeah, I can hear him now too. Cassandra, turn your mic back on. Well, so Jason won't. Jason, Jason doesn't have me? a video. Um, okay. He has a microphone, I hope, um, and he'll be able to uh, be able to speak and present as needed. Okay. Actually, Jason, uh, one thought: if you don't, is maybe to if you've got like headphones or something with a microphone, like Apple headphones, you can plug into your phone. If you use those, I think that would give you a microphone if you don't have one. So now mine says recording at the top instead of live on YouTube. It now says record. recording. Yeah, yeah, did you guys get the, were you guys all experiencing that feedback loop? Just uh, a minute ago, yeah, but now it's not. I'm not uh, now. I stopped the YouTube live streaming and I'm just recording oh. Oh, to my okay. computer this um, and then oh, we'll okay. post that. Um, I think technically right. it'd be a public meeting, which means anyone can join in, but I don't know how to do it without getting the feedback loop. Okay. I'm at least just recording the meeting so that anyone can watch it if they want later. It's now, so let's get going. Is the uh, library first, Camden? Uh, that's correct, yeah. We're gonna start before everybody connects. Let's, let's just start, well, whoever's here is here, but this is Who's not here? time, so we've got, let's see. Brian keeps breaking up. Yeah. You can't hear me clearly. I can, I can hear now. you. You're a little fuzzy looking, but um, I'm always fuzzy looking. Struggling to. <laughs> I just think it's because he has a window behind him. Yeah. Maybe it's glaring or something. Try dialing in. Yep. There you go. That's better. Yeah, try, better. Um, no, just do one of the U.S. ones, and then it should be oh. fine. Okay. Is that better? I don't know who is this. I can't on? see you now. I don't see anything. Yep. Okay. I see Clark. Clark. Clark's name, got Clark not coming pictures. in. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, everybody. It's Scott. I'm here, but no video. But that won't disappoint oh. anybody. <laughs> Darn. I wanted to see if you shaved today. Um, I did not shave today. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay. wearing jeans and a sloppy shirt. But yeah. uh, I've been That's working all day. what happens when you don't go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. And then go ahead. Uh, let's see if I am. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, yes. So the season is going to get started, but we're actually going to start with Cassandra. So I'll turn it over to her, and she's going to talk about the library uh, expansion, uh, children's room expansion, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you've seen this presentation before. I've tweaked it a little bit because you guys gave us about $68,000 this year. And so um, it's going to be a bit of a review. Um, Maybe I should yeah, just say, do you guys have any questions? I'm getting an echoing now. Yeah. Okay, it stopped. We lost Cassandra. Everybody mute your thing if you're not talking. It helps with that echo. Yep. What, it, what helps? Mute. Oh, I don't know if I know how to mute, but that's all right. Somebody who's done it. Where do you bottom mute? Left, bottom left hand corner and on my machine there's a microphone oh. and you touch that. Oh, okay. Cassandra, you want to try again? Okay. Who's so, calling you? Uh, okay. Um, okay, so basically one of the main things that we do at the library is programs. Um, Camden, can you show that third slide? Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, but I can't get the slides to move. Camden, can you show the third slide? It doesn't seem to be showing it. Let me uh, try sharing it again. I, I did go over I the third slide, but maybe I'm not on the right thing. Okay. Um, there. The slides oh. aren't moving. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Right. That's what we wanted. Yes, thank okay. you so much. So you'll see, you'll see how many of our programs, 
How many of our programs um, we do that are for children? We have over 26,000 people coming. Of course, not right now, but <laughs> when we're open, we have a, a ton of, um, of kids that come to the library. And so as I presented last year, we could really use some more space dedicated just to them. Um, we constantly have demand on our meeting spaces and we want an area just set apart that we can use to do programs for kids. We want to do a lot more story times and after school programs. We did a community assessment this year where we found out how um, that's really what people are asking for from us. So that's the idea. Um, you guys gave us a percentage of that last year, which was great. Because of the shutdown, we haven't been able to use it to get an updated quote. So we're using our quote from last year. So Camden, could you show that slide with the, the money? So that's where it would be. Yeah. Okay. So this would be uh, the total cost based on our last estimate. Um, and then you guys gave us 68,000. If you go to the next slide, it'll show that. 68,791 to start in the engineering and to get a more accurate quote. So we really don't, we don't need the full amount. We're just looking for the rest of it and we will have to adjust it as we get the, the correct quote. So that's the total we're requesting. We're also looking for other grants um, and hopefully that will put it down eventually. And then, yeah. This is for a future project um, to work on the basement. But for right now, we're really uh, focusing more on that children's programming room. Um, so does anybody have any questions or need anything explained? Or wanna go over anything? Um, Cassandra, this is Scott, I have a question. Okay. Um, so since a year ago, I know that you were working off of some pretty rough budgets in terms of it's X amount of square feet and the architect told you plan on so much a square foot. Right. And so the 68,000 for this year was to um, advance the design, you know, hire an architect, get a little more detailed information so that right. we were kind of ready to go. What mm -hmm. progress has happened with the 68,000? And I apologize if I was having a little bit of a trouble for a second with the sound. So if you explained it, I, I apologize, but what's happened so far? And do you have any further detailed information like, okay, here's the real estimate or it's looking higher, lower, or what do you have? That is a great question. We, um, we're given the go ahead to start looking into the cost and right around that, that time we had to shut down and so we just haven't gotten around to it yet my guess is that the cost will go down but we just don't have it at this time okay thank you uh, if i can add one thing just to just want to reiterate we weren't given the funding um, until we presented a comprehensive master plan vision and pro forma and, and some extensive analysis to council um, to kind of show what our long-term plans are for the, our operations. And so we had to do some surveying of the community um, and then some, uh, some analysis and, and uh, Cassandra was active and did, and did most of this for the first half of our, our fiscal year, so July to, to December. Then we compiled all of that and presented it to them in June, in February, I believe. And it was only then that they said, yeah, you can go ahead and start putting together the RFP to get the engineers in architectural design work. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just didn't want you to think that we were sitting on it since July, not doing anything. <laughs> okay. That is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thanks. Okay, if there's nothing else, we can move on to the, the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason, are you there? I have been unmuted. Yeah, I, 
So I, I think most of the feedback came through was Jason because he was trying to, he called in and was still trying to watch it and there was a delay between the two. Um, and so I unmuted Jason. Let me uh, name him there. And let me uh, close off uh, Cassandra's and I will switch to the other one. Hey, Camden, while, while you're doing that, I didn't write down the number fast enough. So the requested funding balance by the library was, was it 146? Was that the number? 140. 140. Yeah, 140. 289. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send all these presentations. We got a lot of them just recently, but I'll send them all over tonight or tomorrow morning to you guys so you have those as well. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Jason, I've got the presentation up. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I've got the presentation up, Jason, if you want to just start talking through it. Okay. Uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, our, our first slide or second slide there is our, our prioritized list of, of projects that we have for this year. Um, uh, not, uh, not kind of self-explanatory in that list and we'll just kind of go through each one um, in more detail. Um, first one being Art Die, um, that's kind of just a, an ongoing uh, uh, project as everyone knows. Um, that's going along nicely. Um, uh, the building is up and starting to do a lot of the inside stuff there and, and that's just uh, moving along good. Landscaping might take a little bit uh, getting uh, the contractors helpers up there. They're kind of held up with this uh, getting back into the United States from Mexico. And so that might delay a little bit that we've been told. But uh, other than that, it's uh, moving along nicely. Um, anybody have any questions on Art Die? No. It's kind, no. Of, our, kind of our mainstay project right now. Um, but uh, um, Next one is the Bull Harbor, and Camden's actually uh, kind of spearheaded a lot of the work uh, on this one, and so he's. I'm going to actually defer to him on on this project to to explain that one to you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, yeah, so we asked for a three hundred thousand, and the real focus would probably be uh, the bathroom work um, and to kind of help with uh, paving. But we just want to give you a, a bigger context to what we're trying to accomplish here. This is a the total master plan is a $5 million master plan to do a beach, to do a updated um, boat harbor with two ramps, uh, boat ramps, a uh, fish cleaning station, all these different elements. Um, we, uh, we wanted to scope that down to a phase one, which was just, uh, just under 3 million. So on the, the slide you're seeing right now, you've got the 2.9, that's the amount. Um, we have sought and, got, and received funding for, from the county for 1.4 million, but they want to match uh, that. Uh, in order to do that, we're actually applying for funds from the state. There's the Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant, and then uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember, it's the um, Recreation, um, you know, it's, an, it's a Recreation Infrastructure Grant, I can't remember what the other R is, uh, for 150,000. And then those ones require matches as well. And so we're able to use impact fees, this park, these park funds, as well as our own labor to kind of be the matches we need for all the state and county uh, grants. And so the 300 is a very important um, piece of this bigger picture. And just to kind of, I'm gonna go to the next slide. This is the kind of the master plan. This is the phase one. So the area that's not grayed out would be the 2.8 or 2.9 million. This would cover the redoing all the parking, which I don't know if you've ever been down there recently, but it's cracked, it's not level, so you have massive pools of water dang it. Uh, standing. Um, this would also add the beachfront. Um, it would uh, add a significant amount of, of beach in the area. Wow. Let's see if I can um, show you guys. I can draw on it, but I don't know if I can show you otherwise. 
So I would add in this beach area right here. It would add in what's uh, this uh, plaza, it's, which was where the bathroom would be located as well as a rental facility. Um, it'll add an important water line, um, re, or it'd be piping the American Fork River. Um, and then of course, up, um, redoing this whole parking lot area here, a new uh, entrance. And so there, there's a significant amount of work that's being done. This uh, fits within the, the city's master plan for our bikes and trails as well as over our parks. But this also fits within the county and the Utah Lake Commission's master plan. They're actually working on a, a shoreline trail that will go um, just through this area. It'll um, somewhere around here, it'll connect in. And so this is a, a perfect access point to the, to the lake um, using their, their, I think it's called the Wakara Trail that they're going to connect in with. Um, so that's kind of the short of the, the Boat Harbor one. Do you guys have any questions on this one? What happens if you don't get the full 300,000? We'd, uh, I mean, we have to scale down the matching and, and we just could have to figure out how to do less of the phase, um, of the phase one and figure out what we would be cutting out. But we, we want to make sure if we get the federal or the, sorry, the, the state and the county funds that we, somehow we can we can do the matching elements of it if we don't get the 300 from the park tax i, I think that'd be we'd be just just so close enough that maybe we would get we would just pull you know figure out where else to pull it from but that's that's not something i can say for sure we we would do or could do um so does does maintenance and labor cost to build all this does that go toward the match yeah um like it would be for the paving of the um, so let me go back. Um, we have this in kind uh, and impact fees. Uh, like the in kind would be our labor, um, would be us actually doing the painting work um, and maybe some of the utility work uh, on our end. Um, but a lot of the other stuff would be supplies, materials, and maybe some professional services as well to do some of the more specialized things. So the impact fees and the in kind doesn't count as match or does it count as match? Yeah, that stuff counts as match as well. Okay. All of that stuff, even we're, we're kind of layering the matches um, uh, to each other. Uh, What's the percentage of the match? So they, county just wants a 50% match to what they have. The, the UARG and the RRI want a 50% match and then they said 20, 50% of that 50, so 25% of the total amount could, can be in kind, but the rest needs to be in cash. Okay. I have a question. Um, you said that you're applying for these matches. Um, we don't have any of those grants at all already. They're just applied for, is that correct? The county one is approved. The UORG and the RRI, the deadline's actually this Friday. So we, we're working on the grant right now. We'll be applying for both, but we don't have any guarantee yet that we would get that awarded. So that could that could change the landscape of this as well. There's there's a couple of variables in it, but we're just trying to capitalize on the opportunity that we see here, and we just don't want to not be able to accomplish it because one or the other something doesn't come in place. So we'll we'll have to be a little bit nimble as we work through this. Okay, so you do have the the county is for sure, and then the rest of it is the impact fees are probably for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the in kind and the impact fees. Um, we obviously we can make all those work. Um, you know, we can we can pull those resources, and if we okay. need to dig deeper and get even more, we can do that as well. So really, only eight hundred thousand of it is questionable, right? Sorry, say it again. I said only eight hundred thousand is questionable. The rest of it's pretty for sure. Well, and the park, the park isn't. Yeah. Yep, that's right. The UR, the RI, and the park tax; those funds are still kind of we're we're still trying to lock those in and acquire them. But for each one, the, the the more we can get some and say we have this secured, the higher of a chance we have to secure the next one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think one more, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one more thing that's uh, significant to mention on this is American Fork has long provided probably the second highest mm -hmm. amount to that Utah County uh, restaurant tax that was being pulled from. And for years, those monies have been shifted out to Thanksgiving Point, to Provo City downtown for the convention center, 
while American Fork being the second biggest contributor has been given, you know, anywhere from 10 to $15,000 for Bowery's or something like this. So <clears throat> Derek and Camden and, and all of them have worked really hard to have the county come through in a significant way for this. And, uh, you know, I never, I, well, that's not true. I always like to say this, but the county literally owes us for the amount of money that we have put in um, and the amount that we have got back is just way out of proportion. And while I know that's not the way it has to go, the work that the team has done to, to get these kind of dollars and, and make that happen down there is really significant. And so us being able to match that and take advantage of every dollar is, is really critical in my opinion, just my opinion. That, that makes sense to me. My concern is that, that we have uh, 650,000 out of one point on two projects yeah on projects yeah and that, that that's my only that's my only hesitation and concern me too i feel the same way that's a big bundle of park money headed for two projects that leaves us much less for anything else does if we lose the if we can't match the county's money do we lose the county money yeah, if, if we can't do anything for it, it would we would not be able to, we would lose it. Um, and I, like I said, I, I think we would have the discussion. If we don't get the park funds and we absolutely need that money, we would, just because there's so much on the table here at stake, we would uh, we'd try and find another way. But I, I can't, I can't say I know where 300,000 is in our in our budget. It's, that's a discussion between our finance director and the administrator. I would be. Would we have two years to get to come up with the match, like this year and maybe next year's funding? Uh, they, I don't know exactly when the the timeline is, but whenever they actually award it, they kind of want the project to be underway and uh, substantially. Camden, I've Could got you a do question. a little bond for us? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you, Dale. What What did you say? Could you? I wondered if you could do a little bond, so spread it out over a few years, like we did on our die. That, yeah, I, I don't. I'm not an expert on the bonding too. Um, I, I think sometimes it's difficult to, to bond in in small amounts. And actually, right now, bonding's in particular difficult. But that's just a coronavirus issue. The the markets just aren't aren't great. Um, but uh, other, I think if we get to that, we need to we just bond. We would look into that if that's an option. Instead of a bond, you could just get a loan. A small business loan. Possibly, I don't. I don't know yeah. if cities can get small business loans, but I mean, we would pursue all those options. I'm sure we would look into making sure this happens uh, one way or the other. Here's, here's just, a question: You can't use uh, the UR money. Can't use the county money to match the UR UR money at all, or anything like that. Yeah, I, I think those can go towards it, but that's still not getting us to the the 2.9 um, that we need. We still kind of, you can see if you, as you add it up, they can apply to each other, but we also mm -hmm. just need the dollars just to get to the 2.9 as well. Okay. Hey, Camden, I've got a couple of questions on this. Um, one, do we have a feel for the usership, so to speak, of the boat harbor and how much of it is American Fork residents versus people from all over use it for one of a couple of access points to the lake. Because I wonder how much this is benefiting AF residents and how much it's benefiting county and beyond residents. So that's question one. Question two is, and I, I just can't remember without going back to the presentation, what did the city survey results say about prioritization by the residents? for the boat harbor as compared to other city projects and facilities? Yeah, so for the first question, the boat harbor right now is pretty heavily underutilized, I would say. I, I, we just asked, I asked for last year's and we had like 125 um, passes. Um, and so I think invariably those are probably local um, just because it's kind of like a secret virtually to everyone else. Um, and the intent of the county is to, you know, as we build this up, is to make it more regionally known. And so there's going to be a marketing effort to do that. 
But that's not to say it would diminish its value to American Fork City. It just would increase yeah. to everyone else. I mean, the fact is, is that it's the most northern boat harbor on the lake. And so all this, all the community in North Utah County and maybe even in South Salt Lake County, if they were more aware of this and if this facility was better built out and accommodating, may want to take advantage of it. But that would also mean it would only increase the demand in our within our own community. Um, and it, if we had a beach to it, that would, uh, that would predominantly impact our, our local community because you know it's so close that that's those are the people who are going to want to just hop over and uh, you know use utilize the beach and other stuff. Um, now the second question is uh, if I remember you, you were asking Scott uh, the uh, the demand survey. relative uh, to the survey and what other um, other uh, demands there were. Yeah, like what do the residents say they feel about yeah. the boat harbor? Do they care about it? Do they want to use it? Do they not yeah. even know about it? That kind of thing. Um, the comments and uh, information on the boat harbor is sparse. It's not high on the list. Um, but this is a, um, this, it, it, it's not as if, I, so how do I put this? The funding we have is very specific in what they'll, they'll award it for. And so at the county, we weren't getting funding for other stuff for the county. There's certainly, the county's not going to fund roads uh, for us um, or the fitness center or some of these other things that our citizens are saying they uh, or want or that's a priority to them. Um, and like I said, the Boat Harbor is not, I don't think it's uh, on everyone's radar. And I think the demand would go up as people see and appreciate it and would want it. Um, but we, what we have here are specific funds and an opportunity to use them in a very specific way that we want to capitalize on. And what, hap what, what this means is that we can free up resources so that we to not have to put towards the Boat Harbor at a later time. And we would hopefully be able to put those resources towards some of those other projects that are a higher priority to our residents. And so to answer your question, the Boat Harbor is not as high as other things, but that's not to say that we don't have a great opportunity here right now that we'd want to strike while the iron's hot um, and capitalize on. That wouldn't benefit the community. Do you think that some of the, oh, do you think that some of the uh, reason that the ship is so low is because of the algae bloom that keeps coming? Yeah, I think there's a general perception sure among everybody um, regarding the algae bloom and the news does not help because they really try to report it actively and they don't give much um, information on like where and how localized it is and how little of an impact it is to the rest of the lake and especially our area. So part of this would be our own communication campaign to kind of educate them on them to let them know that the uh, value of the Bar Harbor is extends far into the summer than they realize. Um, and that's something that the Utah Lake Commission, who we're working with on this, uh, they're, they've been trying to be really active on that too, to, to kind of educate people. The algae bloom is something that's been around for well over 30 years. It's, it's always been there for, as, for what most of us can remember, but um, only recently has the news kind of created a thing out of it that's kind of turned people off in general. So the second algae blooms mentioned in the news, people are like, well, I guess that's, I guess the lake's done. When in reality, it's only happening on the very south end where there's really no harbors or um, uh, recreational activities going on. So we would need some um, education on that end if we were to do this so that it would be usable. And that's the plan. Even in with the uh, UORG and the RRI grants, they you have to we have to submit like what our marketing and uh, educational efforts are going to be on it too. So we're kind of working on those right now. If you look at the uh, chart that the survey did, uh, it doesn't even mention the boat harbor. When this, I'm looking at the chart where it said if they had a hundred dollars, how would they spend it? The boat harbor isn't even listed. Yeah, it's it doesn't it doesn't reach the top ones as, as you would expect. Roads and, and fitness center and public safety and these these real heavy hitters are going to be all at the top. Um, the boat harbor is mentioned, but it's just so infrequent. I mean, if you had if we had 125 passes in a population of, of 30,000, obviously it's um, it's greatly underutilized right now, and that's not to say it's not a valuable thing that we'd want to invest in, and it couldn't become far more utilized. It also diversifies our recreational opportunities in a community as well, um, which would be also important. 
the chart I was referring to is this uh, park spending allocation. It says if they had $100 to spend on parks, recreation, arts, and culture, how would they spend it? Oh, the, the white harbor is not mentioned. Okay, yeah. I'll talk to the community survey we do as a city. But yeah, it sounds comparable. Thank you, Camden. Hey, let's move on to the next uh, project. Okay, very good. All right, Jason, we have to the restroom. Okay, uh, next project is uh, is a, a, a restroom at Quell Cove. Um, this is a project uh, that we worked with our Parks and Trails Committee quite a bit. It's a, it's a very important project to them. Uh, we received a lot of feedback from them and the community on a need for a restroom at the, at the lower level of the amphitheater right by the entrance to accommodate one, uh, you know, maybe some elderly or older uh, people who it's more difficult for them to get up to the upper restroom and to accommodate, uh, you know, ADA access and, and you know, give someone in a, a wheelchair or with a disability access to a restroom right there at the, the entrance to the, uh, to the amphitheater. Um, this is also a project we feel that uh, greatly benefits um, a lot of the, the plays and the arts and, and weddings that go on there. Um, just uh, gives uh, more access to a, to a restroom and, and water uh, there at our facility and, and uh, is, is something that would, you know, greatly enhance that, that area. Okay, the playground. No questions on that one? Mm -mm. No questions. No. All right. So next one, uh, we, we're trying to replace, you know, like I said in the past, we've got some, uh, uh, a lot of playgrounds in town that we're putting at the same time and they're, they're coming of age and uh, seeing a lot of necessary repairs with those and we're starting to try and replace those with uh, some new playgrounds. Um, uh, looking to do uh, some really cool playgrounds that would encourage people to come to town and, and use those playgrounds. Um, and uh, and to you know get more people in town and plus replace our 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 aging uh, playgrounds. Um, a real cool, nice playgrounds uh, do cost a lot of money, as you can see. But also on the lower end, you know, uh, for obviously for lower amounts of money, um, like we did at Robinson or something like that, we can we can still do nice newer playgrounds and uh, replace that way also. Um, and so uh, this, like I said, this is something that we're we're trying to do every year to to try and catch up on those playgrounds and and. Uh, uh, the feedback we've had so far with the new ones we've had has been great, and people are really appreciative and, and enjoy these these newer playgrounds that we're getting. Um, we presented a kind of an awesome playground set that ranges from 200 to 400. Um, but just know that if if you remember last year, you know a playground could be like 80,000 for a more standard one and it is important for us to replace the aging 15 year old playgrounds that we have so that would be even that would be appreciated i mean it'd be terrific and we would absolutely put it to use is just uh, to replace one of our standard playgrounds and maybe we look for an awesome playground at a key location at a, a different time but we, just, we want to be flexible on this one anything would be would, would be great okay all right the trail so another project um, that we've been working with the Parks and Trails Committee is uh, they're they're very passionate about uh, getting some uh, recreational park uh, opportunities uh, below the freeway. And you know one thing we we talked about uh, right now and a big talk topic of discussion is is trails on the south side of town and really a goal of getting uh, you know our trail from the Murdoch Trail up above Art Die down through town and connecting down at our Bull Harbor. And then with the, the master plan of the county is having that shoreline trail, a lot of opportunity there for people to go from different places, um, you know, through town and to, 
uh, to, you know, to really, really utilize those trails. Um, one, one project we're looking at is uh, a trail to, for these individuals down along the Bull Harbor Road and that's end of town is to access uh, our parks above the freeway. And one of those is uh, to access Rotary Park and have a, a trail option there that, that a family could, could access this trail and do it, do it safely and to, to get up to uh, Rotary Park, which is, would be from 200 East along 400 South and then down 100 East across the freeway and then go along the frontage road to that point. Um, this was this again. This was a project, another project that uh, um, our Parks and Trails Committee uh, uh, was really passionate about, and uh, um, just to uh, start getting some opportunities for those residents on on that end of town. I have a question. Um, do you have any idea how close the county is to to getting that shoreline trail that we're trying to come up to? Um, I do not. Um, Camden might have a better idea on that. I can find out. Um, I, they they definitely have pitched it. Uh, the Utah Lake Commission has pitched it to the county, and the county has been committed to funding um, already portions of it. But I don't know to what extent they're at with it. Um, I don't know if it, their their funding their approved funding has gone yet all the way up. But I, I think they're planning on doing it in phases, um, starting from like Provo and working its way up and around the lake. So I can find out where they're at and uh, kind of what their timeline and funding is for it. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Does any of this, uh, is it impacted by what they want to do with the connection to the front runner? Like connecting the front runner across? No, yeah, this would complement that actually um, because they are gonna be adding in a trail that's gonna be funded through MAG to that road. It's, it's 200 it's, south of where the front runner is. And so they're right. gonna add that trail and it'll go to, uh, uh, I can't remember the road that goes under the freeway up there. Um, and then this would- 300 West. What's that? 300, 300 West. 300, 300 West, I would connect there. And then this portion would connect the community there. And if we can just do one more leg at some point in the future, which is part of our uh, near term goal, then we would be able to kind of have a, a trail that goes, um, along the frontage road, it would connect to 200 South as well. And so that kind of supports our, our goal to kind of get the people on the South side of the I-15 to the front runner station, as well as to parks um, easily until we can start getting parks down there um, at a greater rate. Um, and our goal to overall do important key connections like from Murdoch down to the Boat Harbor and from the front runner to uh, the Boat Harbor and Murdoch. So it's, this is kind of uh, in I have a question. Yeah. I drove it today, and the, along that frontage road, there's a lot of sidewalk. So you're proposing this to be on the north side of the frontage road, but on the south side of the frontage road, there's almost sidewalk for that whole distance. Why don't you just widen the sidewalk or connect the entire sidewalk? Um, I mean, you're going to want um, side sidewalk or walking ability on both sides, and the sidewalk on the south side, it's like half of the half of this portion. And it would be the demo work and other efforts to to take it, widen it, and to change it would be more costly than to utilize the open width that we have on the north side. And the sidewalk is, um, it's like four or five feet or something like that. And we're wanting to go to 10 feet for a pedestrian pass. To, to be an effective bike and pedestrian path, you need to have it a little bit wider. 10 feet. Than that. Yeah, and I ride my bike down there quite often, and the sidewalk is not an effective answer to that. Yeah, you normally, and you have the aprons to, when you pull into the businesses and other stuff too, that you'd have to navigate. Thank you. Okay. The last one, park upgrades. So last one, uh, this is our park upgrades. We, we, uh, we have this, uh, we have this project, I guess, you know, every year, and it's been great uh, with our new garbage cans. And uh, this last year, we were able to get uh, three of these nice benches along our trail at, at different 
various locations. And the cool thing about that is I was able to have a scout project, put those in, uh, put the pads in and they installed the tables. And, and so, you know, between the benches and uh, cans and replacing our picnic tables, they're really adding a, you know, a, a new feel to our parks with these amenities and, and the cans are really high quality. You can tell by the picture and, and uh, they've, they've just been, uh, it's been a really good, uh, good project for us and, and been able to really just make some, they're, they're small items, but they really do enhance uh, the overall quality of a, of a park. So that's, uh, that's on the it. side of things. Uh, do you have any questions? We, we also have Eric has a, a few projects of his own as well that he could talk about. Let me jump in now, Camden. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll go quick. I know we're over our time on the city, but uh, as you know, the rec center's closed, so it's good to see all of your smiling faces. I just look at bare walls right now, so this is good for me. Um, the I did submit five projects. Um, I'll just highlight real quick and then get to the questions. Um, the scoreboards would be at three parks, uh, be, two at Beehive and one at JC. They would be replacing scoreboards we haven't used for 10 plus years. Um, the city would be providing uh, the install, the labor, and then the electrical conduit and wiring and things like that, and then purchasing the scoreboards for those fields. Hey Derek, have you, have you explored uh, corporate sponsorship? Because a lot of times corporations will pay for the entire FASA scoreboard just to have their name on that. Yeah, we will explore that. Uh, typically we've, we've worked with like Pepsi and Coke, but um, I think if we, if we get some funding to do this, I think and get some matching funding is how I would probably try to do that and, and maybe need less funding. Um, but we would go pursue some of those. These would have space for the uh, for the advertising banner on them as well. Okay. So that would be an option for us. Um, the remaining four projects are at the fitness center. So we had a consultant last year and we've had a patron committee that have, have evaluated our long-term needs and our short-term needs and developed a plan and this fits within that. These are some of the top priorities from that. Uh, one would be to expand the weight room um, into the spin room area and um, and then move the spin room to a, a racquetball court area um, and this would do all the uh, all of the work to to create that space can uh, I ask a question on that one Derek yes okay um, would it be possible to put the spin room somewhere else other than a racquetball court. I know sometimes it's hard to reserve a racquetball court as it is to take one more out. That's taking out a third of the possibility. Yep. So you're the first people I've said that publicly to. Well, besides the council. So don't don't go tell people I'm taking out a racquetball court tomorrow, or they'll come find me. We've looked at several different areas trying to find um, an alternate location because I I really don't want to take a racquetball court. Um, we possibly could do a we do have one storage closet we can convert and it would be about the same price so the money would stay the same if we receive the funding we would then start talking with our patrons and say this is more patrons and say this is what we're going to do and get some feedback yeah because the way i'm looking at it we have more than half of the rec center or half of the rec center used just for gymnastics right now whereas that you know that's a smaller amount of the populace and I was just thinking if we could move it into a section or something, it might be more useful to the overall populace of American Tour. Yeah, we would definitely look at that. It's not totally said it would have to be a racquetball court. That's option A, but we would definitely be willing to explore other options. Thank you. Uh, the other one's a, weeb, a Wibbit system and a wall. Uh, one of the things we've highlighted is, is more things to gather the youth and give them things to, uh, to recreate and make the competition pool a little more fun year round. Uh, we have the leisure pool in the summer and then once we put the bubble on, it's, it's pretty much a flat water. So this would bring in some elements that uh, we could use for youth groups, for rentals, uh, for the facility, 
and then just for general day admission, people could have access to these. So, hey Derek, question on that. What about storage of that thing? What it, it looks big, and it's I'm wondering about that pool, the competition pools used for practices and meets and all of that. Where does such a large, not the climbing wall so much, but the wee bit thing, where does that go when the pool is being used for something else and the bubble's on? Yeah, so the, as you mentioned, the wall would stay up, the Wibbit system would, it's it would deflate and then get rolled up and then we could roll it out the double doors and we would just store it out uh, covered on the pool deck and then roll it back in and reinflate it. Um, so it wouldn't be up every day. Um, is doing that reasonable like on a daily basis? Like, I mean, I, I know yeah, I'm, they're most, in the from swim practice almost their whole life and my whole life it feels like. <laughs> and it seems like either morning or evening, the whole pool is used in the lanes and so I just wonder how useful that is and how realistic it is to take it in and out or move it out of the way or whatever. Yeah, it, it is labor intensive um, and would be a process with our lifeguards. Uh, but looking at it, we could, there's, when we're not using the lane spaces, we would move it over to those areas. And if everything was used, that's when we would take it out. So it would definitely take some, coordination on our end, uh, but we think it would be worth it. Thank you. So uh, the last two, the front desk, um, this is number four in the priority uh, of, of um, just remod re redesigning that and installing a new front desk for the entrance to the recreation center um, and the security and the things that would come with that. Um, the last one is the shade structures. If you've driven past the rec center, uh, you can see those that they're up now. They're nice and colorful, and we're looking forward to using those um, when we get to reopen, um, hopefully. And uh, this would allow us to add a couple more um, on the edge of the pool deck and add to what we've already put in. So those are those are the requests. Uh, more. Um, fitness center uh, focused, but uh, excited about the ones that the parks have also applied for the work that Jason and Camden have done and, and what those could bring. And Derek, does the front desk remodel, is there a, a capital improvement budget that the city has for you for the rec center that this would be more appropriately placed in that versus park? That's what I think. Yeah, when, uh, I can't remember who reached out, they said the park committee is gonna have an extra $100,000 this year. Why don't you just jump in on that? So, but no, um, I, I've submitted it through capital um, improvements through the city and I, and I put it here as well, just in case maybe it was a half and half, um, but I've requested it from both at this point. So, yeah, I've, yeah I've tried, tried to put the city that into uh, those and off park is never meant to be the, an extension of the city's regular budget capital or operating. So, you know, sometimes I, I feel like the city doesn't end around thinking, well, I just go to park because wink, wink, we can approve yeah. this. So I'm hopeful that the city, the city council and Clark, you can chime in on this, that they do not view this as a, the dumping a, ground. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I could time. share, um, as I've applied for projects, I've tried to apply for ones that would give park the most exposure. We still have all of our other, you know, capital improvements, uh, like replacing the boiler on the swimming pool and some of those things that are less, um, you know, noticeable by the project. So it definitely isn't a, a, a try by the city to uh, just dump it there. It just is a, a project we thought would be valuable and visible to the public. So Derek, could you get your priority list? Yeah, my priority list would be how I went through one scoreboards, two weight weight room, okay. three, yeah. the Wibbit the system, yeah. four would be front desk, and five would be shade. Yeah. Where do the shade covers go, Derek? They would this this set would go on the east side of the competition pool. Okay. So we put we put the four over on the west side, and then this would put three on the east side. Okay. 
Would you go through those uh, priorities for me again, Derek, so I can write them down? Yes. Number one, scoreboards. Number two, weight room expansion. Number three, the Wibbit wall, the Wibbit system and the uh, aqua climb wall. Number four, the front desk. And number five, shade structures. Thank you. Thanks for us on this, Derek. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, Camden, next. Yeah, that's it for American Fork City, unless you guys have any other questions. Uh, otherwise, we can turn it over to Harrington. We have uh, Spencer and Samarissa there, um, and they can take over. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Where's the baby? How's everyone doing? Staying healthy? That's good. <laughs> Where's the baby? Uh, my sister's watching her. <laughs> we, got a little, we got a babysitter. Very important Zoom conference call we had to take. So. She's becoming a little more independent, so the virtual meetings aren't working as well. <laughs> well, we want to thank you, first of all, for letting Harrington Center for the Arts present on our FORC programs. Uh, we're excited about the programming that we have developed through Harrington Center for the Arts and also about the possibility of their growth through the park grant and through your support. Uh, so our four programs. Cam, did you wanna? Oh, Cam, did you have the presentation up for that? Yeah, do you want me to pull it up? Yeah, yeah you? that'd be great. Yeah, yeah I'll do it. Or, yeah, or we could drive, I guess. Well, I guess it's easier if you do it. Uh, um, yeah, either or I'm fine doing it. Um, okay. Let me go ahead and grab it. So while he's grabbing that, um, so basically, uh, our organization has carefully selected our programming uh, to uh, focus on maximizing the amount of artists that we can support within each event and uh, increase community engagement, fill a void where programming isn't offered in the community, and then also provide that platform. So this type of niche programming allows us for audience targeted marketing it helps us to enlist really invested volunteers into each program and achieve the program's goals. And it also helps us do something very important, which is collect usable data for each year's events. So the first one we want to focus on is, and this is our priority number one, it is Fork Fest. So Fork Fest is our one day music festival that is created to feature the nationally renowned talent that helms from this area and also provide a stage for the next generation of musicians. We anticipate in Fork Fest 2021 having 5,000 plus attendees for Fork Fest um, who will enjoy original music, visual arts, uh, arts and craft vendors, food trucks, as well as activities for the entire family such as bounce houses and foam machines, a children's arts tent. And this year we've actually expanded the children's arts tent to include a section that is all for children exploring new instruments. Uh, this will be accomplished, this expansion and growth for ForkFest will happen through a more robust marketing campaign, continued strong relationships with the city of American Fork and its employees, uh, hiring specialized consultants, and uh, working with the ForkFest committee that we have uh, formed, as well as the volunteers. Uh, we also have a robust volunteer base for ForkFest specifically. So just some numbers from 2019, this past year. Uh, we had, sorry, Camden, am I going too fast? Are you good? <laughs> it's all good. Okay, so for 2000, so next slide. So for 2019, we had um, people attend from 10 different states, 63 different cities. And we, what we were most proud of through Fork Fest was that we were able to support 100 artists. We gave employment to over 100 musicians. And now more than ever, because of the coronavirus, so many people, so many artists have lost employment and have lost job opportunities. And so we, um, that's something that we're really proud of with Harrington Center for the Arts is that we work really hard to maximize the amount of artists that we can support through each of our events and use funding smartly. Um, 
So, and then next slide. So program funds, uh, this mostly just has to do with operational, a small percentage of our, the operational costs for ForkFest. Uh, and it goes for stage, sound rental, and you can see a large portion of that actually goes uh, back to the city of American Fork with uh, uh, hiring the EMS and police to provide staffing as well as renting the venue of Art Dye Park. And then lastly with ForkFest, we just wanted to read you this quote because it kind of encapsulates, you know, encapsulates what we believe ForkFest is all about. So it says, music festivals boost your outlook on the world. The power of music is an incredibly important and unique tool that aids the human experience. When added to a social gathering where people from all walks of life have come to celebrate this art together, it becomes a force unparalleled to anything else. So that is ForkFest. We're gonna move on to program number two. Oh, do you question. have questions? Really, yes. Um, how, how many attended last year? Last year we had 3,000 attendees. Okay, thank you. So this year, uh, for ForkFest uh, 2020, based off of our numbers and the amount of time we'll have for marketing, we anticipate about having 5,000 this year, and then we'll see after this year how we can grow. But yeah, yeah. we're putting out a 5,000. With the coronavirus, we'll see how this year um, ends up. But Who we would knows? like to, with even ForkFest this year, we'd like, we believe we can still expand grow on last year's festival in providing um, an even higher caliber experience and also increase those numbers. If it happens right after the all clear gets sounded, you might have 20,000 people show up. <laughs> <laughs> people will be when eager. Is it planned yeah. for? So when is it planned for? So we originally planned for Saturday, June 13th, but with the governor's initiative, uh, now we've explored a secondary date that's been approved with the city of September 5th. So instead of being a summer kickoff, it'll instead be kind of like a back to school because UVU and BYU will be back into session as well as all of the local high schools. But it's right before football season starts. So it's a good Saturday to, uh, to kind of have more people come. That's a wise move. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that we were responsible in looking at an alternative date, uh, talking with our sponsors and our artists, it made sense to, to really start pushing towards September 5th, especially with marketing. So, cause it's a little awkward time to start to be marketing for something like this. So anyways. Isn't that the Labor Day weekend? Yeah, it, it is. is. Which and it's set for September? Mm -hmm. yes. September 5th. Yes. And we've checked the Farmer's Almanac all the way back from 1960 forward. It's a beautiful day has a 0.001% chance of raining ever, so. <laughs> anyway. Any other questions? No. Okay, so our next uh, program, if you can go to the next slide, Ken, yep, uh, is Chalk It Up, our Chalk Art Festival. Uh, uh, just to review what, what it was, it was a week-long chalk art festival in which local um, amateur and professional chalk artists spent hours transforming uh, the streets of American Fork uh, last year was in downtown into a captivating one of a kind experience. Um, during Chalk It Up, attendees are encouraged to attend the free art classes taught by professional artists, uh, test out their skills uh, with the budding artist section where we provide free chalk to the community to, to try out on the blacktop and then interact with artists that are creating these larger than life um, chalk installations. Um, we, for this summer, uh, we're looking at a different venue. Uh, we are working with the Chamber of Commerce to have the event again included with Steel Days, but moving the event to the newly uh, paved concrete at Art Dye Park. So in between all the ball fields would be a nice venue to showcase having, uh, there wouldn't be any events in the ball fields during Steel Days, but we would have um, all the people come in and walk through the art installation while they're at Art Dye Park. Um, so that's what we're working on. Um, if it's not included uh, in Steel Days, uh, we're looking at uh, some different fun and venues for this as well, or keeping it in downtown. Um, uh, chalk It Up makes art more accessible to the general public. Uh, pastel and chalking the streets is a great way to introduce uh, people to the visual arts and, and is really great for children uh, to explore that medium. Um, we aim to reduce inconveniences that act as a barrier between community members and artists. And then during this event, we offer these free classes to bring together families 
and members of our community to explore this visual art form. And just to add a little story, we had a mom that contacted us that said that her daughter attended the free visual arts class and now is obsessed with chalking. And that's what she asked for for Christmas and for her birthday. And she's been sending us pictures throughout the coronavirus of her daughter out, you know, chalking her sidewalk and making her neighborhood more lively and bright. So that was kind of a cool thing. And the mom saying, oh, my daughter's never done visual arts. And because she did that now, all she wants for all of her presents is chalk sets. <laughs> <laughs> so the next slide, Camden. Uh, so this is our uh, project funds list. It's it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty much supplies for the artists, so uh, that, that we can provide that for them. And then kind of some event. Uh, we were required to do some barriers for public safety, um, and we wanted to try to pay our teachers this time. Last time we were able to we were able to get some free teachers. We'd love to pay them a small fee for their time. Um, things like that. Okay. Uh, any questions about uh, Chalk It Up? No. Okay. Okay, our next, uh, our third project is uh, the art installation, The Walls. So uh, most of you are familiar since it's right across the street from the administration building and right between the historic Harrington School and City Hall. And it really is the first of its kind in our community as this installation provides um, opportunities for the public and for artists alike to enjoy an outside art museum. Uh, and these are created by local amateur and professional artists. And the sustainable steel design allows us to rotate it every six months. And so um, one of the things about the walls is that our organization focuses on finding that balance between the highest level of artistic excellence while reserving opportunities for developing artists uh, in the community to work alongside these acclaimed artists. And so we choose artists from the community. We have actually gone to every high school within Alpine District and talked to the AP art class, as well as actually some junior high students. And we've talked about this kind of being a mentorship program needed for individuals, um, young students who are looking at creating a career in the arts. So transitioning from a hobby to uh, a professional um, job. And so um, each rotation also commences with a free unveiling ceremony that is advertised to the community and all ages are encouraged to attend. We've had uh, about 200 people attend each of our unveilings and we're hoping that with park tax funds that we'd be able to increase that to 500 people at each unveiling. Uh, you'll see in this picture a young girl, she's working on the community mural. And then if you wanna go to the next side, Camden, that has the two pieces. Um, so this is two of the, uh, these are two of the current murals that we kind of wanted to tell you a little bit of a story about. And so um, just to emphasize how important the stories are that are being told through these pieces. So the one on the right, the ADAPT piece, this was done by artist Jill DeHaan. And she has a young son and she spent a lot of time or spends a lot of time researching uh, the environment because her son loves different plants and different animals and she thought it was so amazing to watch how different animals and plants have adapted to their environment whether it's the freezing tundra or the desert or the ocean um, and how they've not only been able to survive but how they've learned to adapt and sometimes thrive and find joy in that environment and so what's really cool is we actually just did an interview with her and posted this on social media uh, about how relevant that is right now to what we're going through with COVID-19 uh, and finding ways that we can adapt. And especially within the arts, artists have really had to adapt to be able to continue to thrive, to be able to reach their audience. And I'm sure all of you have really enjoyed, you know, the videos you've been seeing online from uh, what artists have been doing creatively to stay involved and to give back to the community. Um, the one on the left, this is uh, with the woman reaching up towards the light in the water. Uh, this was done by artist April Dawn. Uh, she's in the white in the photo. And her sister standing next to her was the model for this piece. Her sister is actually battling stage four cancer right now. And this piece is actually based off of a scripture in the Bible. And it's all about uh, pushing towards the light. And so she used the lilies that you see that go all the way from the bottom uh, of the floor of, 
of, you know, a pond that reached all the way towards the surface to be able to find light. And um, anyway, so it was a very inspiring piece. And they talked about the motivation behind this piece at the unveiling and her sister's uh, fight against cancer. So this kind of helps just to show why these poor, uh, stories are important. And what's cool is if you look at the ADAPT photo, you'll see a QR code and uh, people who come to the walls can scan that and actually read about the stories uh, behind each artist. Uh, if we were to be able to acquire any park funds for uh, the walls, uh, it would help obviously with so, us to do so much, but um, what we would do is we would put uh, the park, we can put a park vinyl uh, logo with a QR code and it would direct people, they, they, people could scan the park logo and it would take them back to the park website and people can read about the park initiative. And then we would also, of course, put the park, park grant on our donor board. Uh, we could also do many other things, but this is just a very valuable project that we would love to have park support. And so this is the program funds list. Um, it's pretty straightforward as well. Mostly just covers uh, the materials that we use. Um, the artists spend, you know, one of the artists actually spent about 70 hours on her piece. And so it, it just helps cover at least, you know, they're doing a great service to the community and it just helps cover their expenses. Um, uh, and we can provide the paint and those, those materials for them uh, to help them with that and to thank them for their contribution. Did anyone have any questions on the walls? No questions. Okay. Great. Uh, our last uh, pro, uh, pro program grant request is for the American Fork Concert in the Park series. Um, this is obviously something that many of you are familiar with. It's an American Fork tradition. Um, Harrington Center for the Arts uh, has been approached uh, and has been working with the city to develop a, um, a partnership to manage this series on behalf of the city. Um, uh, and through our marketing efforts and consistently booking quality talent that appeals to the broad members of our community uh, and would support many uh, public artists, uh, that would be the partnership. Um, it's in a traditional event that brings together families and members of our community on Mondays through June and July. Uh, many surrounding cities have dropped their free concert in the park series. Uh, this gives us an opportunity in American Fork to provide this event uh, to draw in citizens from surrounding areas as well as, uh, as our own community and utilizes and highlights obviously a beautiful park in American Fork, uh, the amphitheater at Quail Cove, and also supports and celebrates the, the diverse talent that we have uh, in our community. And then um, these numbers here, so to kind of understand this partnership, so the uh, Councilwoman Carol, uh, in talking with her, she was the representative uh, for um, Steel Days, and this was kind of attached to the Steel Days contract, so she was our liaison a little bit. And we kind of put together a proposal where uh, we would have this hopefully funded through some park tax support. And how we kind of formulated it was that we could have many concerts or a few concerts, depending upon how funding was available. And we'd actually leave it up to the park tax committee to determine um, how many concerts were available for funding. And so that would be our minimum required concerts that we could fund because there's obviously, we could get some free acts, some community acts that uh, are traditional, like the, the marching band every year and, and they don't charge, but we, they do have a little bit higher production cost. So we would kind of take the, budget that we'd have through the park tax and we'd provide a minimum am amount of concerts based on the amount that was awarded and then we could see if we could add any extra in and so it, it really wasn't the city council determining how many they'd like it was kind of left up to the funding body to say you know if that's something that uh, this body would like to support moving forward was kind of the approach um so Spencer, is the minimum yeah. level four is twenty seven fifty reflect four concerts so 2750 is the per concert amount. Per concert amount, okay. Mm -hmm. so and our spreadsheet so, is 2750, but that's one concert. So really, one concert. if it was four concerts minimum, it'd actually mm -hmm. be 11,000. 
Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because the overhead and marketing to put on a series, we would want to have a, a certain amount of concerts to, to put on to justify. Um, and just your sound equipment for one event or just your, you know, that's, that's part of, um, you know, when you're looking at the expense, a large portion of that is just, you know, the sound it takes for one event. It's not necessarily artist fees. It's the lighting and the marketing. Um, it, as with anything with Harrington Center for the Arts, is we really want to focus in on our programs and make sure that anything that we produce is of high caliber and also utilizes those funds well. So we don't want to put on an event that only a small amount of people come to. We want to increase the amount of people that come and actually participate and are involved with each of these events. So that way we really are using funds to their maximum value. And one other thing about this. So we there was a request about a pre-allocation of funds for this summer. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where that's in process on your side or if you've discussed it as a body, um, but that was to help have this summer be a go. Um, one thing that we're looking at here, this request is based on that we need to do some ground level work, mainly in marketing and some consistency uh, to grow the uh, attendance of this event because it would be hard to fund it through corporate sponsorship. But once we were able to grow the attendance numbers through a marketing campaign, um, we could then, we would rely less on park tax funding because then we would have sponsorship opportunities because currently there's, it's not attended enough to secure more uh, sponsorships than kind of uh, the traditional yeah. one sponsor who's funded, tried to yeah, help fund it. So far in, in the past, uh, as we talked to the Chamber of Commerce, it's just been Doug Smith Auto um, and the Park Committee that have helped sponsor this event. And we think that, you know, a lot of people don't even know where Quell Cove is and they don't know about this awesome amphitheater that we have in American Fork. Um, like I said, the people who have lived in American Fork for a long time and know it as a tradition do, but we really think that we should be able to capture a lot more of American Fork citizens and have them come see this amazing park, amazing venue, um, and be able to, you know, really participate and become a part of the growing tradition. Yeah. So I have a question. Can you explain again what the city's partnership will be in this? I understand what you're doing. What is the city's part for these yeah. concerts? So as we've still been formulating the the arrangement, but their portion would they would help with some marketing. They would uh, on their website they would allow us to our designs and scheduling and all of the kind of the marketing materials would be posted on the city's website. And then secondly, they would provide the venue free of cost. Um, so those were the two things that they said they could reasonably uh, provide uh, to help keep the concert series going. So the, the city is not providing any funding for the concerts at all? Mm -hmm. Other than the venue. And right. just the venue and some marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so for us, you know, obviously this is a lot of work for our organization <laughs> and it would be something that we are um, happy to do as long as it's something that the city uh, wants to continue, you know? So it's not something that we would want to do without at least uh, a little bit of help this year. And then in subsequent years, we can help do sponsorships and things like that. Uh, so that way we wouldn't be relying on the park, the park grant. Do you know um, how many really have been coming to each concert in the past with the summer concerts? I've been to one, but I don't know what the usual attendance is. So. Yeah, so last, last year, uh, we actually counted the number of people, at least for all of the July events, because the July mm -hmm. events were the ones that we received a little bit of park tax funding for last year. And so we counted that and it was, uh, do you wanna pull up, let me just pull up the numbers because we have a- Yeah, it was about, it averaged 400 something per Let concert. Let me pull it up. All right, just give us one second. That's right. While he's doing that, do the four concerts involved Steel Days, the Steel Day concert? Uh, no. Okay. So before, plus that one, four plus Steel Days then. Yeah, yeah. So we only asked for funding uh last year towards our four and then towards this june because of how the fiscal cycle works um so Damn, I, I need it here i think it was about 500 
was the average for each of the concert series. Okay. Where are they held? Uh, they are held at Quell Co. Well. And they're either held in the amphitheater or they're held on that large grass section. Hmm. Just right across the street from you. <laughs> right. <laughs> So if you don't know about it, we need to do better advertising. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably right. <laughs> and so, Marissa, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Yes. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Your time. Thank you. Okay, can we have CAF on, on board? We do. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So it may say Leslie, but it's actually me. Um, I'm using my wife's uh, laptop because my webcam camera died on mine. Can you see me? No. No. Oh. There I we go. I can hear you, but not see you. There oh, you there are. There you That's are. That's better. Well, hello, everyone. And uh, I hope you're not worn out. It's getting late, <laughs> but uh, long day. Hopefully, um, you're doing well, and everyone is safe and healthy and happy. Um, appreciate this opportunity to present our information to you tonight. Camden, do you have our slide deck? I sent that to you. Um, can you hear me? No. Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me because I was muted. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I see, that you, I see that you sent it. So I'm just going to open it up now. And thank you. So while he's doing that, um, we have had a good year so far, and we're excited about the next fiscal year. We just continue to grow and um, have been very grateful for all of the support the city has provided and other groups. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the things we're working on um, for the coming year. So to begin with, if you'd hit the next slide, uh, just our mission statement uh, uh, with the emphasis on providing leadership and encouragement for artistic and cultural excellence. Uh, we really are committed to uh, that theme, committed to putting together and maintaining, uh, continuing to maintain an effective arts organization that provides arts pro programming for the city to all members of the community as best we can. And uh, we think we're doing a great job and, and want to do better each year. And so we're, we're committed to improving. So I'm just going to go through the different programs uh, really quickly. If you have any questions about any of them, just let me know. Um, and I'm uh, not sure what order you guys have them there with your packet. But um, starting off with the symphony, um, and Nan, you mentioned the Still Days concert. The AF Symphony has done it for many, many years. Uh, so uh, that's usually not included in the summer concert series for that reason. Um, and we're Grateful to be able to do that again this year with the symphony and the color guard. Um, we have had to cancel our salute to youth concert because of the coronavirus. So the uh, that which is one of the symphony's biggest concerts has been moved to the fall concert. So the fall concert will still be held uh, for the symphony, but that will be their salute to youth. So all of the kids that auditioned for that event. Um, still get to participate. They'll just have a lot more time to practice, um, but they'll be involved in that uh, event in the fall. Um, also, just to report, we just had a, just to give you an idea of, of how the symphony's doing uh, in the winter concert, they combined forces with the Vivace Youth Orchestras, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and it was conducted by Denise Willie, our Vivace conductor, director. Uh, and also they invited Dallin Bale Bayless to participate uh, as a guest artist. And it was a, basically a sellout concert. It was packed 
very well attended and very well uh, received a lot of positive feedback from that concert for the symphony. So we're just excited. They're, they're excited to continue to provide great entertainment as a symphony, over 60 plus members and uh, doing a great job. Um, and I think I covered everything for the symphony. Yep. Uh, so if you can move on to the Wasatch Winds, um, they've had to also cancel their um, uh, concert. So they'll be combining that with an, uh, one of their fall or winter concert. Um, you know, with these groups, they have to spend about two months rehearsing for each concert. So even though a concert may be coming up after this crazy virus is done with, if it's too close uh, and, and has not given them time to rehearse, then, then they, they have to cancel the concert anyway, even though, you know, they may be freed up to hold it at that point. I just wanted to note that, but they're going to be uh, covering their fall concert. Um, they uh, are planning for their July 6th concert, which will be in the new year, new fiscal year, uh, which will be as part of the summer concert series um, as, as one of the events. They, they do that each year uh, as, as part of the summer series. Um, so they're doing a great job. Also, 60 plus members um, really continuing to grow and recruit good people. Um, if you move on to the next one, Wasatch Show Band is doing well as well. Um, they're going to start rehearsing in mid-May, hopefully, and uh, uh, they have uh, some events lined up for the 1st of August is their first event. So they, uh, as I had mentioned before, they're focusing on corporate gigs and small groups and a really uh, a strong band with a strong sound, great sound and, and doing a great job. Uh, if the little photo there on the left uh, is at a little venue in Saratoga Springs where they did a nice, little dance for the locals in that area um, and had a great time with that. And of course, the other one is, the other photo is where they combined with the Wasatch Winds uh, with John Miller conducting to do a concert with them. So they're doing, doing a great job continuing to grow and get their uh, brand out to the community so more people are able to learn about them. And I'll talk more about that marketing wise in a moment. If you'll move on to the next one. I mentioned Vivace Youth Orchestras uh, conducted by Denise Willie. They came on this first year. They've uh, covered their own expenses, uh, but they will be, they are included in the grant this year. Uh, they're a great, have a great sound. I don't know if any of you, any of you were able to hear them with the um, um, symphony. Uh, at that winter concert, but amazing talent for these kids. Uh, and they, they really do an awesome job. Uh, our program manager for the Vivace is, is Matt Stoffer. He's also a parent to some of the kids. And he just uh, stated that it, it's great to be able to get that kind of talent with uh, Denise Willie's uh, ability to lead and teach these kids and to bring out their best at, at such a reasonable price that they charge. So um, they are gonna be holding a summer camp and then have a full fall season, you know, full season next year. So if you move on to the next one, Camden. Uh, Temp Corral, oh, the visual arts, uh, out of order. Um, visual arts, uh, if you'll notice in their uh, grant, they asked for, a significantly larger amount. Uh, about 16,000 of that is for a new kiln and supplies. Uh, she is really, Heidi, the program manager, is really trying to grow that program and add, you know, with visual arts, there's just so many different types of arts you can teach and, and provide to the community. And she's had a lot of requests for uh, pottery 
and ceramics. So the kiln would really help with that. And we could also uh, rent it out to others because they're few and far between. Uh, and so that's that large difference, if you notice that, if you saw that in the grant request. That's why it's so much higher. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd love to be able to add that to her repertoire of, of offerings for the visual arts. Um, you'll move on to the next one. The children's choir, uh, as I mentioned to you guys, I think in the mid-year report, we've added the handbell choir, the brass choir, the flute choir, and uh, who am I missing? No, that's it. <laughs> the, uh, but, and you know, we still have the ukulele choirs and the concert choir. And so they've just got a great uh, variety of offerings for these kids, uh, children and youth of all ages. And they're just really proud of the fact that they really focus on uh, the underserved kids uh, by offering their services for free. Um, and they, of course, still serve Greenwood, which is Title I school, and are just doing a great job with all of the different uh, types of programming and, and classes and training that they offer. Uh, then next one. Uh, I'm going through these really quick. I'm trying to. Uh, Campanogos Corral, it's a picture of them on the Lincoln Memorial with their trip last May that they funded themselves. Um, and uh, they are doing a great job. Just to give you an idea, uh, I was asking Sarah, the program manager, how many concerts they've had to cancel between now and June. Uh, and, and I'm including June for that reason about the rehearsing. And she said 10 concerts. So coronavirus has taken 10 concerts away from the community um, that they would normally be doing. Everything from a, a full concert that they were going to hold in the uh, Valentine Theater down to care centers where they would go and sing for the seniors in the care centers. So this, this virus has really impacted uh, the, the arts you know, offerings to the community because we're all about mass gatherings, right? And that's what we do. And anything, ten, even our classes, most of those are 10 and over. So um, it, it's, it's hit us hard. But just to give you an idea of the number of events that the Temp Corral, Tempanogos Corral puts on each year, uh, they've canceled the next 10 concerts uh, between now and June. But they're going to hit it hard as soon as they can uh, and get back in their routine. Um, next, I think. One more. Uh, community theater is doing great. They're adding, uh, I think I mentioned to you, they added, they're adding a, another production um, and are adding, wanting to do an improv group, uh, classes. They're just looking to expand a lot. And the main thing they're excited about is that they finally have a home now that we have the uh, Valentine Theater for the next three years. Um, to be able to rehearse and perform in uh, and to hold some of these uh, classes and groups in. So they're just tickled to death uh, to be able to not be begging and borrowing for space and sometimes getting kicked out uh, at the last minute uh, with through the schools and other venues. It's nice that they have a home, uh, at least for a while. And so they're trying to make the very most of it, get their, uh, box office up, add classes, add other uh, types of events. Um, and we've got a big one we're planning for next fall. And uh, the, I made sure that it'll, that would be in October if we can pull it off. Not this coming October, but next October. Um, and we're not asking for park tax funding for that one. Uh, it will be funded independently. So if you can move to the next slide. Oh, youth theater. Um, I'm not counting. Uh, so Corrine continues to do a great job, has great attendance, uh, great reputation in the community with her three children's theater uh, performances um, and uh, had to cancel the one that she had normally scheduled for March, but um, they pulled off a dress rehearsal for the parents. Uh, at the last minute before they had to cancel everything else. So, um, 
And then uh, if you'll move on to the next slide. I know I'm taking a long time. So uh, the arts festival, we have decided to move it to the Robinson Park. We got approval from the city to do that. Uh, we planned it for August 28th and 29th. Um, so we didn't have to move it, hopefully, uh, because of those dates. Uh, and uh, we're excited about having it there. We're going to be partnering with the library. Um, they're excited to have us. And also, our, we're tying the History and Heritage pageant in since we've been asked not to use the cemetery anymore. Um, got a lot of fun things going on there with uh, the vignettes and the DUP Museum being there and the Senior Center. We're gonna partner with the, all those groups to hold that festival there. So there'll be arts, music, food, and lots of fun. So artist booth, musical numbers, the, we'll still have the finale concert Saturday night with all nine of our programs, the vignettes, like I mentioned, uh, and classes and events held in the library and a children's arts area as well. So we're really excited for, for that festival. Now, year. Red, there's no request for that. It's just a culmination of the efforts of all the groups. Yes, and uh, what we're trying to do is we we have our my goal and from the beginning with this festival is to keep it independent, to raise our own funds, to fund it. Uh, we just received, um, and that was a good segue to my next point. Uh, can you move on, uh, Cam, into the yep? So. We now have a director of development. She is full time. She has a team of one and we're adding another lady who is with the community theater that also happens to write grants for your view. So we'll have a team of three people working on grants along with our consultants that we have hired uh, to put out. Our goal is a minimum of four grants per month. We just received our first grant from the Sorensen Foundation grant of $5,000, and that's going, Brian, to the Arts Festival. So we'll have $5,000 there from the Sorensen grant to, to fund part of the Arts Festival in August. Uh, with the Valentine Theater revenue, um, we estimate, based on past year's uh, performance, to receive be able to schedule fifty to sixty thousand dollars of income per year by subleasing that venue when we don't need it. Um, and also, we have our nine programs who are cross promoting, and we also have a marketing partner we've recruited uh, and partnered with Revity Marketing, and uh, they've given us a whale of a deal to to uh, help us with all of the programs: marketing, brand identity, and just filling the seats and getting more uh, marketing out there, more exposure of our nine uh, programs, events and classes and, and so forth. So if you'll go to the next slide. So our goals, revenue goals. Our goal is to consistently bring in revenue from multiple sources, large and small grants, major donors, fundraisers and sponsorships. We've got the consulting firm is help us, helping us focus on all of these areas. Uh, and we're really excited about the progress we've already made in the last few months with that effort. Um, sometimes these major grantors, you know, they won't even fund you the first year you ask for a grant just out of practice. But, but once you get the ball rolling, um, then you receive a grant from them. They'll usually keep granting year after year. Uh, our goal then is to make the park track grant left, le uh, half or less of our total budget by 22-23. Uh, dramatically increased box office and class registrations through that marketing cross-promoting that I mentioned and cross-promoting internally and with other arts and civic organizations. Like I said, Cassandra in the library is, is really excited. Uh, she's been working with Heidi with the visual arts for, for six months or more now. We're doing helping do the art galleries in the library and lots of other classes. Um, and we're providing the staffing and, and support for that activity with the library. Um, so we're working to streamline our operations. We want to become more productive and be more efficient and still continue to provide the valuable entertaining arts programming. Those are our, our goals. 
Um, so just in closing, we're, we're fully committed to continue what we've done, what I feel really well this organization has done for many years to provide quality arts programming and services to the city of American Court, surrounding communities, and really serve all our valued patrons very well with great arts uh, programming. So that's my pitch. Anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Um, oh, I did want to mention um, the History and Heritage pageant. Um, we were going to partner this year with the library with the pageant since we're not up at the cemetery anymore, but we still wanted to tie to the cemetery. So we came up with the idea to put little uh, locator stands by each of the gravestones that we were going to highlight. And it'll have a QR code on there uh, where the person can use their phone to scan the QR code and learn about the person who's buried there. And then it's like a scavenger hunt, be able to bring information back from that to the main event which would have been at the library with the uh, library's 20th anniversary, which has now been postponed, but we'll be doing this, this project in the fall with the Arts Festival and the History and Heritage pageant to be able to use those QR codes uh, so that people are still able to go up to the library and learn about uh, some of our community's historical figures, and then we'll be holding vignettes about them at the Arts Festival, and if they get all of their QR codes done, they're able to, to get a prize when they come back to, to turn in uh, and to uh, participate with the festival. So just an example of creative things we're trying to do. Uh, I'm also really uh, working, I've asked all of the arts uh, programs to get creative with uh, coming up with virtual ways to uh, communicate with the community during this time. If it ends up running long, uh, heaven forbid, but um, we're going to come up, we're going to come up with creative ways to, to uh, present the arts and share the arts with the community uh, virtually or, or some way so that they're still able to enjoy all of the talent that we have in our organization and, and out there. So. Um, any other questions or any questions? Hey, Rick, I have a question, this Scott. Okay. Of all of the, you have a certain amount of funding from Park for mm -hmm. kind of what what we would call the current or past, so to speak, fiscal year, and a lot of the concerts and events are being canceled. To what extent? And maybe this question goes as as much to Camden on the the portability of that money. So say you had to cancel 20 percent of your events due to corona can that money roll forward it to partially fund quote well, next fiscal year's requests so i've asked and uh, camden can uh answer that i've asked all of my groups to determine and they haven't got those numbers yet both uh of uh lost revenue and in what they would have estimated they would have brought in if they had held those events. So I'm asking them for that number and also the number of what they would have been spending with park tax funds uh, that they aren't going to be spending because of that. And so we were wondering the same thing. I don't think, I don't know if the city's had a chance yet to think about it or come up with any decision on that, but we'll, we'll do whatever we're, we're needing to do. And maybe Mr. So in terms of, of TAF, what are you wanting the city to, to do? Well, uh, uh, obviously what we'd love to do, like Scott mentioned, is to be able to roll that over. Because what we'd like to do when life gets back to normal is just really hit it hard. I think a lot of people will be wanting to get out of their houses, wanting to um, uh, participate in community events and, and do some things outdoors you know, and uh, in the community. So if we could roll those funds over, that would be the ideal. It would, the, the money would still be going to the same types of things just in the next year. In other words, we wouldn't be using it for something different or new, just more concerts, more better concerts and so forth. 
seems yeah, like that's what he's proposing. If there are savings, I imagine it'd, it'd just be like anything else where Reggie would make the recommendation to the board. And if you guys agreed, you would make the recommendation to council and then they would approve that. Is that not basically what the library is doing? I mean, they didn't spend the 68,000 or whatever yet for various yeah. reasons. And so that's kind of rolling forward in their proposal as well. Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're still hoping that we can uh, use the, the, use whatever funds we need to of that amount to get the engineering and stuff done before the end of the fiscal year, so June 30th. So we're hoping to use it within the fiscal year we needed to. But you're right, if we don't, then it would roll forward. But if there's, if we don't need as much of that, then that would roll, that would go to the park fund balance as well, unless we wanted to put a recommendation to you guys. I have a question, Reggie. Sure. Um, I'm just wondering, I, as I look through your applications, each organization has a general administration allocation anywhere from $1,200 to $7,000. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what is it that those monies go toward? So um, I can go down a list for you if, if you'd like. Uh, so it, it goes toward uh, any rent utilities of our, our own facilities, not for a performance venue, um, maintenance repairs, salaries, uh, any outside contractors like legal fees that TAP has to pay. Uh, it goes to insurance, liability, DNO, um, supplies for the art center, for TAF in general, uh, equipment, office computers network, uh, inventory systems, uh our marketing and pr that we do at a taf level so that we are promoting the whole organization with the nine programs and events um advertising you know printing and copying accounting fees for our accountant and bookkeeper um any taf events that we put on um well where where we've asked for specifically for park funds usually like i said most of the taf events are not part of the park budget uh, but that's one of our expenses and then as and then there are licenses and registration fees that we have to pay each year uh, as an arts organization so okay. I don't know. those arts those uh, license and registration fees are you talking about like uh, music and other things like that? Uh, if it's if it's uh, specific to a specific group then they add it to their budget included in their budget if it's general, like uh, we have uh, an inventory system that part of that annual subscription includes the ASCAP BMI. Uh, I was just, I was just looking at it. it. Okay, that makes sense. Got it. Thank yeah. you. you Reggie, Reggie, isn't that just an internal overhead allocation from your unit? So what they're, what they're showing is an expense, you show as income on the admin p &L. is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So I had a question about a lot of the rental fees um, for each of these groups. Are most of them or a lot of them using the Valentine Theater for practicing or anything? Or oh. are you still having to pay a lot of other rental venue fees? So we told the groups that if it made sense, then uh, they would be able to use the Valentine Theater. And so obviously for the two theater groups, they're both using it. Uh, our two orchestras are too large for the Valentine. The stage is fairly small. Uh, John said he thought he might be able to squeeze the Wasatch Winds on there. But the, the uh, uh, Wasatch Show Band is definitely planning on using it. The Tempanogos Corral had scheduled to use it, uh, but they've canceled because of coronavirus uh, or have had to postpone it. Um, and then uh, the youth choirs are youth, we're going to held an Easter concert there. So yes, every group that uh, it makes sense, obviously visual arts won't be using it at all, but they're going to be using our art center, um, continue to use it where they hold just about all of our classes for the visual arts but yeah we're we're using it as much as we can quite a bit I have a, I have a yeah. question so each one of the programs 
have to pay rent for the Valentine Theater? Because that's what your, spread, your spreadsheets say that they are paying rent for right. some place. And right. if they're using the Valentine Theater, are they paying rent? Right. Well, the Valentine Theater, we have to pay rent to the state each month. Uh, so we have costs associated with that venue. We don't get it for free. So yeah, we came up with a lower price for them to pay so that they're paying something contributing to the cost of that venue, but it's much better for them as opposed to a school or another venue. Okay. So there is some, yep. So how many of these uh, orchestras involve the same children? I'm just thinking there's a lot of uh, programs you have going with the different orchestras and the symphony and the Wasatch Winds that do similar things. And I'm wondering like how many participate in more than one of those events of programs? So we have a couple. And, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you, and I was also wondering about if you could use the same director, like if you combined some of those programs, that's you what know. I had mentioned in my presentation where we're looking to streamline the organization. We're, we're looking to at as many options as we can to uh, uh, become more efficient, more streamlined, more effective, and still provide the same level of, of uh, arts programming that we're doing and, and continue to improve. So um, yes, we can. To answer your question, each of our groups, like the Vivace, I wasn't, we weren't out looking for another group, but they came to us needing a home and uh, they fit perfectly because, let me give you a, a couple of examples first. The symphony has a wait list on some of their groups. For example, if they have enough violins or enough uh, 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 trumpets, they have a wait list for those sections, some of those sections, because they've got people wanting to get into the symphony who can't, right? Uh, the Wasatch Winds is a wind symphony only, but they have some of the situ same situation. We do have a couple of people who've been around for a while who play in both, but only one or two. But the good news about that is, is that the community is large enough and growing enough, uh, we can keep the both symphonies full with hardly any duplication uh, because there's enough people out there who are wanting to play in a, a community symphony orchestra. And then there's Tempanoga Symphony Orchestra, who's independent from us, who's also nearby, and they, they have no problem getting participants as well. Uh, what the Vivace does is uh, it, it serves to feed into, you know, as a feeder group with focus on youth, uh, preparing them to participate in an adult orchestra. They're not ready yet, but it gives them a, a home and a place to perform and to, to uh, you know, get better and better before they're old enough to do that. So it, it's pretty strategic the way we're doing it in terms of, and the other thing is that a lot of our members from both orchestras come from all over the valley. You know, our program manager, Jacob, with the symphony, he lives in Spanish Fork. And so it's not just American Fork participants. So we're bringing a lot of good people in who, who have heard about the American Fork uh, Symphony's reputation. And uh, since you mentioned that, I, I wanted to read this to you in, in, in my closing. Um, this is a letter we got from uh, uh, someone who attended the concert that I mentioned that had uh, Dallin Bales and uh, the Vivace participating with the symphony. He said, Dear Sir or Madam, my wife and I were very impressed with the evening with Alan Bayless on February 24, 2020. He is definitely one of our local musical favorites. Our real surprise was the American Fork Symphony and the Vivace Youth Orchestra. This is the first time we had heard them. We were very impressed. In the program, it showed how donations could be received. We would like to contribute $200 and be involved in the future as well. Thank you for being involved in such a great cause. My wife grew up in American Fork, and it gives her name, and we are now living in Linden after moving to Utah from Seattle eight years ago. We anxiously look forward to the next AFS concert, sincerely, 
and they included a $200 check in there. So we get a lot of that kind of feedback. Um, there's a, I mean, it's, it's, uh, especially with the growth that Utah's been having, it's a large community and, you know, American Fork's always been known as a hub. Um, we've got a lot of talent around here that want to participate. Uh, and uh, we're excited to have, and then I didn't mention the um, show band. It's just a different style of band for smaller groups. So there's a lot of people who don't want to participate in an orchestra. The show band gives them more of a modern sound and a, and a younger focus. If you combined, like, which I think you mentioned that they have a little bit, but if you were to combine some of these concerts with a couple of these groups, it seems like it would save money if you combined concerts with more than one program. Each group is doing that um, each year now. I mean, we. Because it seems like they each list their own concerts and the expense of their own concerts. But if they were combining with another program, you yeah. would cut the expense of the concerts. Right. Well, and so it depends on how they do the concert. Some of them will do it combined where you have a conductor for each group and one group goes first and the other group goes second, like with the uh, show band and the Wasatch Winds have done that. But it just so happens that. John Miller's the same conductor, so uh, he's, he conducts both of those. Uh, so yeah, we're doing that and we can, and I have en encouraged our people to do that more. Um, but uh, it's also their goal to, and we've, you know, the city has asked us to go out and make a bigger impact on the community uh, with what we've already been doing to increase our, our impact with the arts on the community. So that's the kind of the directive I've given them as program managers and as programs um, to, to do more of their own as well. Um, but like I said, our goal is to really ramp up the grant writing, the major donors, the sponsorships, so that the uh, work tax funding is only half or less of our total budget. Okay. Thank you, thank you for Thank you for your presentation. You bet. Thank you. I'll be well. Thank you. And if I could just make a, as a, a final thing for our, our board, just to start your allocation suggestions on that spreadsheet of Camden, and then send that to Camden sometime tomorrow before noon in Camden, so we can. He can present that on that consolidated spreadsheet that he has and then tomorrow we'll have our discussion where we go through and explain some of the uh, the differences in the recommendations and then uh, discuss those so is that is that clear yes yes if Thank i can so oh, yeah, mention ahead, one thing and we are as a city we're seeing the effects of the coronavirus on our sales tax revenue um, which would impact um, the park tax revenue as well. I don't have any of that information yet, but I was going to try and talk with our finance director who's meeting with our city administrator today to see if they can help estimate that a little bit more. But we're probably going to see less revenue um, than we originally thought that we were originally budding, budgeting towards. So I just need to get them and see if they're going to, if they're actually going to recommend we lower that amount and, and to see what that would actually look like. But I'm just kind of giving you a heads up. Um, we're, we're trying to just figure this out as it's happening. And we just, it's really hard to have a crystal ball and know exactly what the next fiscal year is going to look like at this point. Yeah, I was guessing that. <laughs> but maybe we plan for maybe a million and, and just kind of plan that for right now, knowing that it's probably not going to make the 1.2, but maybe just a million. Yeah, I don't know what the exact amount will be. I, I think they're going to... Uh, I, they're going to want to be conservative. It might even be, from what they're saying, it might be more, even more than that, that, or we'd have to go lower than a million. Um, but maybe we just prioritize, just as kind of you, the presenters do, you guys prioritize so that you kind of know what the bottom of the list looks like and how you would change that. Yeah. I, I thought the revenue would go up with all the toilet paper sales. <laughs> And man, if, if we had Costco, that might be a different story. 
<laughs> or if they tax groceries, that would be awesome too. Yeah. <laughs> the state tried that and nobody liked it because they only got part of the story in the media, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But we, we've called our car dealerships and they said they're like 20% of what they were expecting to be at. So it's definitely having an impact even right now. One thing that um, might help, that, this isn't critical, but if we send Cam, uh, Camden all the sheets, it's a little hard sometimes to see the full spreadsheet or the on the screen. So if you get it put together, even if you're sharing it, could you send it back out to us so we can yeah. view on our own computer? Yeah, I'll do that. As soon as I get them all together, I'll, I'll send it out to everyone. Okay. When do you need them by noon tomorrow, earlier? Noon's no, noon would be great. Okay, and then you'll send us another invitation to a meeting, right? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll work on that tomorrow morning. Now the meeting is tomorrow at 5.30, is it? 5.30. 5.30. Yes. If there's no other questions, then uh, I, I move that we adjourn the meeting. I second that. Second. Okay. All in favor? Just log Bye. off. Bye. <laughs> See you. Bye. All right. Thanks. Adios. Yeah. Bye. Bye.